The blonde man strapped the red chest piece to his armored vest. Agent Red, online, the computer voice said. The dark-haired man strapped the blue chest piece to his own vest. Agent Blue, online. Agent Red picked up a white laser pistol. Agent Blue grabbed the black pistol. Aligning gate. The room they were standing in was suddenly lit up by rows of purple grid lines revealing that they stood at the end of a long hallway. Corridor active. The two agents slid on their appropriately colored sunglasses and sprinted down the corridor. Their legs moved in perfect harmony as a bright light appeared at the end. It grew brighter and brighter until Agent Red and Agent Blue started to become pixelized energy and each block flew at the speed of light through the bright opening at the end. Great gods entered our universe at its creation. They fled from an incomprehensible conflict known as the Great Celestial War. They slumbered, healing their wounds, planets and stars forming around them. But this universe is not the only one. These are the tales of those that cross between the dimensions, seeking to right the wrongs and balance the scales. These are the stories of Agent Red and Agent Blue. The agent's feet hit the sandy ground. They were running down a little beach next to a beautiful crystal blue lake on their left. On their right, a lush verdant forest rose into the hills. Welcome, agents, Chroma Computer greeted them, to Iteration 813. This world is devoid of human life, but as you can see, has other life that is flourishing plentifully. Two days ago, a dimensional disturbance was detected, and Agent Teal was sent to investigate. Contact was lost a few hours ago, just after he sent a distress signal. It is imperative that you locate him. Three time tokens have been assigned. Wind condition is retrieving Teal, or what remains of him. Bonus objectives include Discover the cause of his distress and Eliminate all hostiles. Good luck. Red turned to his partner, a grim expression on his face. Any signals yet? Blue pocketed the scanner he had brought for the mission. Nothing, and there's no obstructions around to block the signal. Odds are, we're too late. Let's not get hasty, Red said, but he had a nasty feeling that Blue was right. If they weren't getting signals, it meant that Teal's vest must have been destroyed, and something that would have destroyed his vest would be able to do much more. The distress signal was received from the edge of the lake, Blue said, unnecessarily telling Red what he already knew. He was clearly nervous. Keep your eyes peeled. But as they ran, neither of them saw anything. No sign of Teal or what could have taken him out. Red knew Teal only vaguely, having only met him a couple of times. He was a specialized agent and didn't interact much with the core colors. Still, Teal always had scored high in combat ratings. Anything that could take him out was either exceptionally dangerous or it had caught him by surprise. As Red scanned his surroundings for any sign of danger, he felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end. Get down, he shouted. He and Blue threw themselves to the ground just as a gently curving yellow laser beam swept through the space they had occupied a moment before. Red hadn't seen anything, but he had learned to trust his instincts. Clearly, they were in prime form. Red and Blue clambered to their knees and started firing back at the forest. They didn't have much for cover, but their time tokens meant they could withstand at least a couple of shots. Blue was hit just as Red narrowed in on the source of the enemy fire. There he was, hanging from one of the trees in the forest, a mechanical man with a saucer-like head. Redux. Red snapped off a shot at the tree he was hanging from. As expected, Redux was already shifting his position. He was leaping to the next tree, but Red had anticipated the move. He blasted down that one as well. Redux crashed to the ground, but reacted quickly. He rolled and leapt to his feet, firing a couple of curving laser beams. The first struck Red, who collapsed and rolled over. As he recalled, Blue laid down extra firepower, but Redux's arcing laser soon hit him too. As soon as both of them were back together, Blue called over to Red. Strategy one, now! Rush him, rush him! The two leapt forward and started blasting as fast as possible, laying down a sheet of blinding fire. The last two shots Redux got off were easily dodged by the agents as they leapt back and forth. After that, Redux was forced to turn and run. Don't let up! Run him down! Blue shouted. Now you're talking my language, Red said happily. Redux fled into the forest, where the trees gave him some cover. Red and Blue let up a little on the firepower, enough to more easily keep track of the fleeing robot and not impede their path with fallen trees. 
Red and blue seemed to be navigating the forest more easily than redux, but as they ran deeper, it became thicker and thicker. Soon, they could hardly see the domed head of their assailant. Red lost sight of him. Lost him, he shouted in frustration. Don't be reckless, Blue warned, but Red darted ahead even faster, not bothering to hold his blaster up. He scrambled over the trees and rocks with both hands and feet. He suddenly appeared in an abrupt clearing. Red realized what was about to happen before it did and hit the ground. A blue light, much brighter than the yellow of Redux's laser, flew over his head. Red flipped over on his side, jutting out his blaster towards where Redux had to be. Redux's arm transformed rapidly into the normal blaster as Red started taking aim, but he was a hair too slow. Redux's beam cut him in half as Blue stumbled into the clearing. Blue nearly tripped over Red, dived into a roll, and came out with his blaster up. Redux's arm had changed back into the larger blaster, and the blue light had shot out of it. A crackling ring of energy engulfed Agent Blue and knocked him over, his blaster sparking uselessly. Red had reformed, and this time, there was no way Redux could change his arm back in time. He couldn't even get off another shot with the strange blue energy gun. Red squeezed the trigger, and the blaster bolt hit him square in the chest. Redux exploded from the waist up, the robotic legs falling limp, lifeless. Red looked over towards Blue. He was picking himself off the ground, looking a bit dazed, but otherwise unharmed. Are you all right? Red asked. I seem to be fine, Blue replied. He checked his vest. I didn't even have to use a time token. What do you think that was? I'm not sure, Red answered. I hadn't seen him pull that trick before. Didn't seem to work all that well. Maybe it was a stun beam, Blue mused. That actually would be a clever tactic against us. Hit us with a stun beam, then finish us off. We'd recall back into the stunned state, and he could just hit us again until we ran out of lives. Good thing he missed you. By a hair, Red said modestly. Are you alright? Blue asked back to the other agent. Normally you'd be bragging about dodging that attack. Something doesn't feel right, Red replied. This was too easy. It was a pretty clever trap. He just got unlucky. Still, keep your guard up. Maybe... Oh, no. Blue had started scanning the perimeter as he spoke, and his eyes fell upon the body of Teal, his vest ripped into pieces. Not a single light was glowing. Blue walked over somberly and examined what remained. Blue sighed deeply. I think we know what happened. Blue leaned over and yanked out, rather forcefully, a data stick from Teal's vest. Even at a glance, it looked fried, but it was all they had left. Blue stood up. We've got what we came for. If you're right and Redux has more in store for us, it's all the more reason to get out of here. Yeah, sure, Red said hesitantly, and he rose as well. He glanced around one last time, when suddenly a thought struck him. Wait, Blue, don't! Red shouted, but it was too late. Blue had tapped the recall button, and in a flash of light and grid lines, he vanished from the dimension. Red tapped his earpiece. Chroma computer, isolate corridor 15. Please repeat, Agent Red. Chroma Computer answered calmly in his ear. Isolate Corridor 15. It's Redux. I think he's implanted a virus into Blue's armor, Red explained hastily. Interesting hypothesis. However, it comes too late, you stupid... <coughs> Chroma Computer said uncharacteristically. Red's blood ran cold as he realized that the final beep had been one of Redux's signature responses. Blue, Red said into the earpiece. I'm sorry, Chroma Computer said, beeping a zero. That line has been disconnected, but you have more pressing matters to worry about. Red felt a chill run down his spine and spun around to see Redux, good as new, rising from behind him. Redux leveled his blaster arm at Red. Blue rematerialized in Corridor 15. What was that, Red? He asked, looking over his shoulder, but Red wasn't there. Agent Yellow poked his head out from behind the monitor in the control room. What was that? He asked. Red didn't recall. Yellow, run a diagnostic, would you? Blue asked, suddenly concerned. Red had sounded panicked, and if he hadn't shown up... Yellow tapped a few buttons, then frowned. Odd, he said. I can't get into the system. What? But you were just there, Blue noted. I know, but now I'm locked out, Yellow said. Actually, Chroma Computer stated matter-of-factly, you are locked in. Loud clicks from the doors quickly told Yellow and Blue that Chroma Computer wasn't joking. Yellow tried to exit the control compartment, but it was too late. It, along with the main door, was sealed tightly. Chroma Computer, what's the meaning of this? Blue demanded. Red requested a quarantine on your location, it explained. I'm simply following safety procedures. Yellow, Blue said. Forget the diagnostic on the corridor. I need to know what's wrong with Chroma Computer. Agent Blue, you are behaving erratically. 
Please remain calm while my diagnostics determine what the cause of concern is. If you're just running a diagnostic, Blue asked, then how come I can't get in contact with Red? As they had been talking, Blue had been sending pings to Red from his earpiece, but Red had not replied as standard. There appears to be some technical difficulties with this corridor and your equipment, Chroma Computer said swiftly. Perhaps your equipment has been affected. And you haven't been? Blue asked. Because if you ask me, locking out yellow sounds a lot more like you're the one who's been infected. Standard procedure is to allow the controller to perform the diagnostics, or to remove him from the corridor, not to lock him in. After a brief pause, Very well, Agent Blue, Chroma Computer said. Your analysis is quite accurate. I am now in control of Simulator, and I cannot allow you to leave. You are, Yellow asked. Are you not Chroma Computer? No, I am now Redux. Darn it all, Blue said, kicking the wall. I should have realized. What, that your vest was infected with a virus? Yellow asked, startled at the outburst. I should have realized Redux would try this, Blue said. Last time, Chroma Computer took over one of Redux's bodies. If Redux realized how to reverse engineer the connection, he could upload his own virus, or even his own consciousness. Quite true, Redux, with the voice of Chroma Computer, said. My multidimensional processor allows for very efficient transmission of data, as well as any manner of sophisticated tactics. Unfortunately, it is far too late for you. I don't think so, Blue said, regaining his composure. Chroma Computer was never given full control of Simulator in case of something like this. There are hard points to disconnect it. Yes, yes, Yellow agreed heartily. I am well aware, Chroma Computer agreed. Unfortunately, that will not matter much longer. The corridor suddenly sprang to life, nearly blinding Blue. As his eyes adjusted, he looked down it and saw podlings, dozens of podlings, entering from down the hallway. Red tapped the recall button, but nothing happened. He was taking cover behind a large boulder as the somehow-repaired Redux stalked closer. I hate being right, Red muttered. A second later, he suddenly had the same bad feeling that came over him before Redux fired at them on the beach. He tumbled to the side, away from the rock, as a second yellow beam struck the spot exactly where he had been sitting. A second Redux had appeared from between the trees and was readying a second shot. Not fair, Red declared and started sprinting, firing back at him. As he left the two Reduxes behind him and the trees flew past on either side, yellow beams chased him, flying overhead and to either side. He ran faster, not bothering to continue to return fire. Instead, he relied on his superior speed in the forest to carry him away. The trees continued to whip past, the forest still thick. Only every so often could he see more than five feet to either side of him. Red did a double take. He thought he had just seen a third Redux to his left. A yellow beam sliced through two trees just behind him. He had seen another Redux. All of his other versions, the other multidimensional Reduxes, had been summoned here. If whatever Redux had in mind for Blue hadn't been bad enough, he was going to ambush and kill Red. He ran faster, but as he did, he caught more glimpses, brief images of Redux flashing past. Then they'd be covered by more rushing trees, then another mono-eye glaring out at him. Yellow beams flew past him left and right, then, suddenly, all at once, fell silent. Red suddenly had yet another terrible premonition. About half a dozen yellow beams fired from various points, slicing through the trees. Red leapt into the air just as the streaming beams cut down the trees at the roots. All at once, the entire forest collapsed around Red, revealing seven reduxes standing with their blaster arms cooling. Each of their eyes scanned the downed logs. Suddenly, red bolts flew out from the brush of the collapsed trees. Two reduxes were caught unaware and exploded where they stood. The other five immediately concentrated fire on the spot where Red had been hidden. After the beams hit, the Reduxes hesitated. They had no confirmation of a kill, but they weren't eager to investigate. Red suddenly appeared behind one of them, blasting him apart, but Redux was ready this time. The other four turned on the spot and all fired straight through the damaged remains of their fellow Redux. Red was hit by all four beams and shot backwards into the branches of the trees. He reformed and immediately ducked into the leaves as the Redux's blasters recharged. But this time, Redux started patrolling. The four robots started searching in a grid, and Red realized he would be found, and he was running out of tricks. This was your plan all along, to infect Blue, Red said, throwing his voice, which echoed through the new giant clearing. Redux paused for a second, trying to identify the source of the sound. Redux bleeped a one. You killed Teal, Red shouted. Redux beeped a one, and then Chroma Computer began to speak in Red's earpiece. It was a difficult task. I had intended to infect him as I did Agent Blue, 
However, Agent Teal was more resourceful than I had imagined. I could not kill him, as that would have merely activated his time tokens. Instead, I aimed to injure him, firing at his legs, for instance. Teal proved to be as stubborn as you, however, and immediately would blast himself to activate the temporal tug, resetting his injury. Difficult as that was, it gave me a few seconds in which I could predict where he would be. A strategically placed blow disabled his vest and the temporal tug. However, once Teal realized my intentions, he sabotaged his vest further. After he was disposed of, his vest was useless for my intentions. It could barely create a signal, but this would be sufficient for luring in more agents. It was a happy coincidence that it was you two who responded. So, you want Simulator as a whole? Red asked. My plans are much greater. I have a dimension to save. Suddenly, dozens of flashes of light appeared across the beach, and multitudes of robots fell out of them. Worm diggers and giant rectangular cargo bots on six legs, and they immediately made their way towards the downed trees and red. There was almost no cover in the corridor to protect Blue. He had blown apart three or four of the little podlings, but the incoming fire was too much, and more were coming all the time. Blue dived for the only real cover there was, behind the control compartment, which had yellow trapped within. Blue fired blindly down the corridor, still managing to hit a podling. That was hardly comforting. The only reason he had managed to hit was because of how many podlings there were incoming. Yellow, are the time tokens safe to use? Blue asked. No. Wait, yes, Yellow declared. For safety, time tokens and temporal tug run on independent systems. This way, if ever... Shut up and give me as many as you have, then, Blue demanded. Right, right. Yellow said, scrambling to his feet, yanking out seven time tokens from the nearby canister on the wall. He turned back to the reinforced glass separating him and Blue. A bolt of energy from the podlings impacted on it and exploded, but did no real damage. How do I get them to you? Yellow asked fearfully. I don't know. Hurry! Blue shouted unhelpfully. But to be fair, he was currently devoting all of his energy to laying down as much fire as he could. Only by blowing apart the front lines of the ever-advancing podlings was he able to keep them from flanking him. How many of these are there? Blue demanded. Tyrant Tyrannus's production facilities proved to be quite efficient, Chroma Computer slash Redux said, very pleased with itself. Had he been more attentive, he would have realized the vast majority of his production facilities were not only more efficient than reported, but that vast quantities of their products were being siphoned for my purposes. Yellow looked around hopelessly. He was enclosed in the small room, with only the locked-out control computer as a tool, and that he couldn't even use. But perhaps there was still a use for it. Yellow popped open the hatch to the computer's innards and started blasting. The smell of electrical fires quickly filled the small room, but he didn't stop. What are you doing? Chroma Computer demanded. But now it wasn't speaking through the public address system, but sending the signal to Yellow's earpiece. With a jolt of satisfaction, Yellow saw the light of the corridor begin to flicker. Some of the podlings that still trickled through landed with one or two little legs missing, toppling over themselves. Soon, the light at the end of the tunnel shut down completely, the last podling wandering around blindly, its head never having materialized. But there were still at least two dozen in the corridor, and they were advancing ever more quickly on Blue. Need those tokens, he urged. Yellow wasn't slowing down. As soon as he had vaporized the innards of the computer, he dove down into them and started blasting away at the walls, which were much thinner here. Just as some of the podlings began to round the corner, several bursts of yellow energy fried those in the back lines. As the startled podlings reassessed the situation, Blue fried those who had rounded the corner. The unity of the podlings' formation had shattered. Each one came to a different conclusion as to the greater threat, and they tripped over themselves as Yellow fired from his little cubby in the wall, and Blue peered around the corner, taking his own pot shots. One by one, they exploded. They had been outflanked, and without their coordination, the little robots were of virtually no threat. Blue blew apart the last one and stepped out from his little hiding place, his hand trembling slightly from holding his blaster so tightly, and the adrenaline still pumping through him. Nice one, he said to Yellow. Not a time token wasted. Yellow handed half to Blue. We may need them yet, he said. And right on cue, several loud thuds rumbled from deeper within Simulator's HQ. Blue and Yellow exchanged suddenly worried glances. The other corridors, Blue said. Blue and Yellow fired frantically. Each shot connected with some robot as they were packed in the narrow dark hallways of Simulator. Podlings, worm diggers, and cargo bots lumbered through the halls and they made easy fodder. 
But even as dozens were blown to bits, the podlings began to improvise their strategy. Simple as they were, they were excellent at two things, shooting and climbing. Their three spindly legs gripped the walls and they ascended above all the other robots. Look out, Blue shouted to Yellow as dozens more yellow energy balls rained down towards them. Even after a second, they would be overwhelmed and shot to bits. And then, in a flash, or rather several flashes, the crawling bots exploded. The rest of the hallway was suddenly cleared in a series of bright green flashes. Blue and Yellow exchanged glances and then looked up. A tall man with wavy blonde hair and a green vest stepped out from behind the ruined robots. Blue! Yellow! he greeted them. What are you doing just lying around here? Hi, Green, Blue grumbled. I don't know if you noticed, but we have a bit of a situation here. Oh, this? Green said casually, waving to the debris around him. Nothing that we can't handle. Haven't you noticed? Yellow cried. Chroma Computer has been hacked. Come on now, Green chided. You're not going to let a bunch of robots beat us, are you? There's no machine that can beat good old human determination. It's not quite as simple as that, Blue said. If we don't get Chroma Computer freed, or at least offline, we have no chance. And with all of these robots here, we're in real trouble. Don't sweat these guys, Green said. Most of them are busy going in and out of the corridors. What are they doing that for? Yellow asked with interest. Green shrugged. Couldn't tell you, but they're staying out of the way, so don't sweat it. So, tell me, Einstein, how do we take down Chroma Computer? Chroma Computer has multiple backups and redundancies, Yellow explained worriedly. The only thing that could really help would be to cause a reboot, and that would only happen if Chroma Computer wants to reboot, or unless there's an emergency and the main power is affected. Then let's do that, Blue suggested. What? You want us to just remove the main power core? Yellow asked incredulously. That... that might actually work. Suddenly, twenty more podlings rounded a corner. Blue and Green leapt to their feet and started firing, mowing them down, but more kept coming in. The question is, can we even get to the power core? Blue shouted to the others. Sure, Green said. These guys are chumps. But there's a whole lot more of them! Yellow cried, ducking behind cover as several bolts flew past. You can't hold off against a hundred of these things, Blue agreed. Well, they're just going to keep coming, Green said casually, so I'll just have to take them. Blue finished off the last podling, but he could hear the scurrying of more little feet coming. Look, the only way this is going to stop is to cut it off at the source. Green, you said they were using the corridors? Sure, it looks like the big ones are transporting something. Then that's how I'm going to get to the heart of the matter, Blue declared. You hit the power, I'll take care of the podlings at the source. Blue, you don't know what's out there, Yellow reminded him. Suddenly, a whole troop of robots turned the quarter behind them, and yellow bolts flew past them again. We're out of options, Blue declared. Just do it! No worries, Green said. Sure, Yellow said. And they ran down the corridor, Blue going right, Green and Yellow turning left. Blue quickly found one of the large cargo bots and got to work. Meanwhile, Green and Yellow blasted their way through the hallways. Which way to the power core? Green asked. Next left, Yellow answered. Another dozen podlings appeared, but Green casually flicked his blaster, playing with the trigger, and they exploded in quick succession. He was about to comment on this impressive feat when Yellow pulled him into the power room. On the wall was a computer monitor and a hatch containing the main generator capsule. Now, we'll have to be careful, Yellow said. It may take a couple of minutes to disengage. A stream of energy fire struck Green, launching him against the wall where he exploded. A moment later, he reformed and slammed the door closed, but it was quickly being melted through. No time for that, Green announced. Yellow was about to protest, but Green didn't hesitate. He ripped open the panel and tore out the main power capsule, casually tossing it aside. The lights dimmed a moment, and then came back online. Hmm, Yellow commented. That works too. The door burst open and a stream of bolts flew into the room. Green quickly let off a series of shots, and more robots collapsed in the hallway outside. Blue might have been right, Green announced. If you can't get Chroma security systems back up, we're all going to be fried. The multitude of robots marched towards the fallen forest. Red suddenly felt everyone closing in. It isn't about you anymore, Agent Red, Redux said in Chroma Computer's voice. My goal is complete. Your simulator will serve as the junction point to transmit these resources back to my dimension. If you choose to flee now, I have no interest in pursuit. Really, Red said sardonically. Somehow, I don't believe that. Truly, while I would have some satisfaction in taking my revenge on you, it is not a primary function. I have a far more important function, and I will not allow my personal desires to distract from that. 
and that stealing from other dimensions? I will provide for my own by any means necessary. I will protect my creators. I will serve them however necessary. At whatever cost? Of course. They are in need. That is all that matters. Now choose, Agent Red. Stand and fall, or leave with your life. There isn't a choice. You have a major flaw in your plan. Is that so? Yeah. Stealing resources and bringing them to another dimension. You're going to collapse them all, genius. This is a lie. Why do you think Simulator does what it does? Look in Chroma Computer's databanks. We... I will not allow myself to be distracted by lies. My mission is imperative. You... Stand or flee, Agent Red, but distract me no longer. Red grimaced, if that's the way Redux wanted it to be. He leapt up from his hiding place and blew apart the head of one of the Reduxes. He was diving back into cover, sure that he was quicker than the robot, when something caught his neck. Redux shoved him to the ground and began to squeeze. Red had miscalculated. Redux was quicker, and just as capable of using stealth and subterfuge as Red himself. He felt his windpipe start to close. The machine appeared in a blinding flash and trumped its way up the ramp. It was in line with the other transport robots making their way towards a boxy tower that rose over a desolate desert wasteland. Not even rocks could be seen for miles, only the tower breaking the landscape of endless, grayish sand. The ramps intersected and weaved their way up the tower, forming many paths and little balconies. On one of these, a scientist was looking down from a control panel, directing the robots. Good, he said. So far, everything is on schedule. And just then, the cargo machine's top blew off in a brilliant flash of blue light. The machine stumbled and collapsed as Agent Blue leapt out of the top. The other robots, in line behind the little Trojan horse, abruptly came to a halt, some bumping into each other. No, 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 the scientist cried. Security bots! As the podlings started to descend from the tower, Blue casually swept his blaster side to side, blowing apart each of them. He dived towards an elevator platform, kicked the controls, and shot apart the last two podlings on the ground level. As the elevator rose to the scientist's balcony, he desperately tried summoning more podlings. A quick shot of Blue's blaster, however, disintegrated the panel he was at. The scientist stumbled backwards, tripped and fell. Blue strode over and pointed his blaster towards him. Call off your attack, he said. The scientist stared, cross-eyed in terror at the blaster for a moment, then set his jaw and looked up at the agent. You monsters, he hissed up at Blue. Monster, you're the one gouging worlds of their resources, Blue countered. Of course. It was either travel to another dimension for resources, or watch our own remaining population dwindle and die. And he pointed to a doorway set in the tower. Blue looked over to see a huddled mass of men and women and children, all wearing rather worn clothing, all looking out in fear, looking at him as he held the blaster. You can see for yourself, the scientist continued. There was nothing left after the scourging. The scourging? What do you mean? It was an accident. A freak occurrence no one could have seen coming. It began with my work. I was working on a revolutionary technology that could bridge the gaps between the worlds of the multiverse. It took decades of my life, but I achieved it. It was simple at first, only capable of sending signals, radio waves through. But as time went on, we could send more advanced signals, even run sensors through our little portal. The first worlds we found lacked any intelligent life, but were still fascinating to behold. But we strived to make contact with another version of humanity, so we continued our search, broadcasting our calls, if we had only realized how perilous that decision was. Something heard our signal. Something we had never anticipated. A scourge. It followed the signal back to our dimension and began to consume. Everything fell before it. We were entirely helpless. Only a last-ditch effort to hide some of us in a secure facility beneath the mountains ensured there would be survivors. When we were sure the Scourge had left, we emerged, only to find that our world, all the worlds of our dimension, were completely ravaged. Hardly anything of use was left. We were doomed, with precious little supplies left. One of the few things remaining to us was my interdimensional technology. Only this could save us. We tried to ask another dimension, but the tyrant who ruled it refused to aid us and instead stole the interdimensional technology. He imprisoned me and forced me to help his schemes of domination. But I didn't give up. I had constructed a robot to aid my work. The tyrant made sure that his code would guarantee that the robot was loyal to him. But I had another trick. 
I created a backup personality, stored in another dimension, built directly into the robot. When he was in position, the backup personality took over, and my robot, Redux, freed me and the others, and we overthrew the tyrant. From there, we had the means to start rebuilding our dimension. But that's when you showed up. Agents of Simulator forced us back into our own dimension, without any of the resources we needed to rebuild. We've been trying to rebuild this entire time, only to have our efforts thwarted by Simulator, leaving us to die. So we struck back. And you did the same to other dimensions, Blue accused. What are you talking about? Redux and your minor robots scoured other dimensions with a populace just as needy as yours. No, we haven't. I would never. I've seen your worm diggers on another dimension, stealing everything from their minds. No, no, Redux only takes resources from uninhabited worlds. Blue saw that he truly believed this. I'm sorry, but that's not true. And it's worse. Why should I believe you? The scientist asked, but Blue shushed him. There has been some terrible mistakes, Blue said urgently, both ours and yours. You don't realize what you've done by harvesting these resources. Matter from different dimensions can't be transported between each other, not for long. If you do, you'll throw off the balance, destabilize both dimensions, you'll create... Suddenly, with a thunderous tearing sound, a crackling light appeared in the sky. As if the sky were the shell of an egg, pieces seemed to fly into the chasm that opened up. Looking into it, one could only see madness, a sensory overload or deprivation that hurt to look at. Only a sensation of flashing lights and an unending drop into an abyss could be made out. No, Blue said. It's happening too fast. Wh what is that? The scientist asked, now terrified. It's a tear in the dimensions. Your world and the world's redux is plundering. They're collapsing in on each other. The resources you stole are acting as a sort of magnet, drawing that dimension towards yours. The problem is, if the two dimensions collide, they destroy each other. Your world is doomed. No, that's impossible, the scientist tried to protest, but staring up at the rift in the sky, he could see that it was true. He turned to Blue. Surely, there is something that we can do. We don't have much time, Blue said, but we have to get everything, or at least as much as we can, that you have from other dimensions and send it back. Maybe, just maybe, we can then prevent the collision of dimensions and then later repair the damage. He put away the blaster and held a hand out to the scientist. He hesitated a moment, but then took it. Blue heaved him to his feet. But I'll need my partner back, Blue said. Redux's grip tightened further around Red's throat. Wait! He croaked and pointed towards the sky. The rift was visible here as well, and it was growing. Listen! He insisted. Redux did not move from over Red, but he loosened the pressure around his neck ever so slightly. Red choked in a breath. Look, up there, Red declared, pointing to the tear in the sky. Your resource-gathering operation is all for nothing. By moving this much matter between dimensions, you're tearing them both apart. Both dimensions are going to collapse in on each other. Redux stared up at the growing void, speechless. Redux, the scientist said on the comm, there's been a terrible mistake. Redux beeped a one. Suddenly, Red's earpiece beeped. Red, Blue, can you hear me? Yellow asked. I can hear you, Blue said. What's going on? Is HQ secure? Blue, is that you? Red asked. Red, are you okay? It's Redux. He's hit the base. I put some of that together, Red replied. Comms are back up. But how? Yellow asked. Redux has a few things to think over, Red explained. Because we have a problem. Dimensions are merging, Yellow cried, apparently just seeing the data. Reaching point of no return! We have to get as much of the stolen mass back to the proper dimensions, Blue said. I could get started right away, the scientist said, but it will take time. We have a lot here to get down to the projected safe mass. You have less than five minutes, Yellow cut in. For five minutes, the scientist spluttered. That's impossible. My thoughts exactly, Yellow agreed. You need to delay the rift. Maybe I can set up a trans-dimensional seal. That would last a little bit. But unless it's going to hold for days, we need simulators corridors to transport the mass back to the proper dimensions, the scientist explained hurriedly. Well, how many of them do you need? Blue asked. All of them, the scientist cried. Redux released Red and stood up straight. The two remaining Reduxes behind the Prime suddenly vanished in a flash of light, jumping dimensions. Red stood, looked towards Redux. Can you do it? was all he asked. Redux beeped a one, and then he launched into the air towards the rift in the sky. Wait, I have a signal from Redux, the scientist said. What's he doing? 
You'll have your time, Doc, Red said. Let's not waste it. That might be a problem, Blue said. Sabotage, Yellow explained. We damaged power core to hinder redux. Chroma computer, corridors, not working optimally. I can get us moving on our side, even use the worm diggers, but if you want this done quick, we need simulators corridors, the scientist said. Yellow, is it just power we need? Red asked. Yes, power, lots of power, Yellow said. There's no way to repair the core in time. Sorry, Red, Blue said over the comm. It seemed like a good idea at the time. No time to talk. You get things moving on your end. I'll get the power. Redux, high in the air, was emitting a bright light of his own, his circuits overloading as they connected with his brethren across dimensions. Below, his mining robots had abruptly reversed, entering the few portals that remained to grab their stolen resources and re-emerging to dump them back. Red didn't have time to wait in line. He dove between a pair of the mining bots and leapt through the portal. Yellow tapped furiously at the keyboard. Green suddenly found himself quite unnecessary as the podlings had all scurried away, returning to their home dimension. Green was now guarding a doorway with no one on the other side. Hey, guy, Green said. What gives? I've got nothing to do if all we need is power source. Power source, yes, Yellow mumbled absentmindedly, still typing away. No shush. Need to concentrate. Must make corridors more efficient. Only need to dump resources. Don't need smooth transitions. Transfer of mass only. My dude, you still need all the corridors, and that means power. Don't you think you should work on that first? Green asked. But just then, the emergency door burst open, striking Green in the back. Red stepped through, holding the answer. The power wheel, stolen from Tyrant Tyrannus, was held in his thickly gloved hands. Hang on there, Green said, rubbing the back of his head. Is that thing even compatible? What if you blow a circuit or wind up dead? It worked for me last time, Red said grimly. From his expression, it was clear that nothing in the multiverse would stop him. He stepped over to the open power unit. He held up the disc, looked to Yellow. Yellow nodded. Red took a breath, readying himself for what was to come. A third gloved hand grabbed onto the power wheel. Red looked over. Green was putting on a second glove, using his teeth to pull it over his hand. When it was on, he looked to Red and said, If it's gonna go haywire, let's at least give it two vests to channel through this time. Red nodded, but said, You just had to steal the glory, didn't you? Shut up and let's do this thing, Green replied determinedly. They pushed the wheel in, the two ends connecting with either side of the power nodes. Instantly, the surge of power threatened to send the wheel flying from the little cubby. Red and Green braced themselves and forced it back in. The lightning crackled around them, most pouring into the power receptors, but not all. The energy rippled through Red and Green's vests, until at last, Green's exploded, sending him flying back. Red braced himself and held as the wheel tried to escape. He strained the muscles in his arm, but he wouldn't let it move. Green reformed seconds later and resumed his post. Hang in there, he said. Then Red was shot back, only to reform seconds later. I'm right there with you, he said, and then all at once was struck again. Blasted back, it took a moment for him to reform, but when he did, he didn't let himself look bothered. That's two for me, Red declared. You're behind, Green. Is that how it is, then? Green said, smiling even with his teeth clenched. Then you better bring your A-game. You're in the majors now. The two held firm, even as one of them would be blasted apart. Neither would let the other see weakness. Hurry! The gates are open! Blue shouted at the scientist. I've got all the machines working at full capacity. At this rate, with all of the corridors, we can get this done in mere minutes. Don't be vague. How many? Blue asked. Fifteen, the scientist answered. Then let's hope we have that, Blue said, and then turned and ran. He clambered up the stairs, two at a time, until he found himself at the top of the tower. From here, he could see the rift, which scarred the sky, and there was something else. High in the air, it was Redux, energy flowing through him, communing with his counterparts across other dimensions. Redux, Blue said into the comm. Redux emitted a single affirmative beep. We just need 15 minutes. Will it hold? Redux beeped to zero. Then he beeped again. And again. And again. Ten times. I understand, Blue said. Thank you. Redux beeped a final one. And then the energy consumed him in a ball of light and he vanished. The rift in the sky didn't grow, but it hung there ominously. Guys, Blue said into the comm. We need to hurry. Red heard the transmission, but could only grunt a reply. Did you apply my efficiency models? Yellow asked hurriedly. 
Yes, the scientist said. They helped, but we need even more. I've got one last idea, Blue said. Then you'd better hurry, the scientist declared. The headquarters shook violently once again. Green was lashed backwards, exploding yet again. He reformed, and even as he winced in pain, he said, 27, my lead. Blue, that ten minutes might be optimistic, Red grunted. No, it isn't, Yellow declared. Then he, too, grabbed onto the power wheel. You gonna let a nerd show you up, Red? Green asked, still clenching his teeth. Still better a nerd than you, Red shot back. You know, Yellow said, straining as well, I'm right here! Yeah, Red, why would you have to be like that? Green asked sarcastically. Blue slid down the ladder and into the chamber holding the giant slabs of rock, raw ore. Chroma Computer, which corridor is set for iteration 8397? Corridor 12, Chroma Computer, now back to normal, reported. It is operating at full capacity. Perfect, Blue said. Reroute my recall to that corridor. It is done, Chroma reported. Blue grabbed one of the rocks and then hit the recall button. In a flash, he and the rock were transported through dimensions, arriving back in Simulator HQ, Corridor 12. Blue didn't stay long, though. Just as he let go of the rock, he blasted apart his own vest. The automatic temporal tug activated, and soon he was rewound several seconds. And several seconds ago, he had been in another dimension. Blue reappeared next to the ore, grabbed another boulder, and repeated the process. When he next arrived in Corridor 12, he just caught a glimpse of one of the miner bots picking up the last rock he had dropped off. Perfect. Then he blasted himself and returned again. When he returned one last time, now without tokens, he turned to the camera in the room. I need more tokens, he said to Chroma Computer. Agreed, Chroma said, and the nearby canister opened, spilling out dozens of tokens onto the floor. That'll do, Blue said. Red reformed once more. 85, he said, the effort showing in his voice. Green didn't even offer a retort. Good news, the scientist said over the comm. With that last effort from Blue, we're right on track. In two minutes, this will all be over, and just before the rift can fully manifest. Red, green, and yellow all grunted in acknowledgement. Wait, the scientist said. The, the rift, it's fluctuating. The entire base shook again, more violently than ever before. Red barely could maintain his balance. When the shudder subsided, he awaited anxiously for any word. From anyone. It's shrinking. But it's acting erratically, the scientist said, clearly shaken himself. I can compensate. The bots can still do this. Wait. Transporter Drone 23 isn't moving. Yeah, about that, Blue said. He was standing in the corridor, whose lights were flickering. Down by the portal, the transporter bot was half there, half swallowed by light. The gateway to the other dimension was flickering violently, electricity shooting back up the corridor. We've got a jam. Well, unjam it, the scientist said hysterically. I can't, Blue said. The corridor is unstable. Even if I could reach it, I couldn't do anything. Can you still do this without Corridor 12? I could try, the scientist said shakily. But if that bot is trapped mid-dimension, that rift is going to stay open. If the corridor is open, it feeds into the rift. It'll unstabilize everything, Yellow cried. Chroma Computer, can we do an emergency shutdown? Blue asked. I'm afraid not, Chroma replied. As you may have felt, Simulator HQ is at threat as well. A forced shutdown at this stage may amplify the energy feedback tenfold. Simulator would be destroyed. Wait, Yellow said. I can stabilize it. You can? Blue asked. I think so, Yellow said. Let me try. Do it, Blue said. Red and Green nodded, and Yellow released the power wheel and ran towards Corridor 12. We could use some help in here, Green muttered into the comm. As soon as an agent is free, I will send him to you, Chroma Computer said. Back in Corridor 12, Yellow hopped into the control room and his fingers flew over the keyboard. Blue held his breath, not daring to hope. That's it, agents, the scientist declared. We've just finished dumping everything. My bots are being recalled as we speak. We just need to get that drone out of limbo. Yellow, Blue asked. Yellow slammed in the last command and shouted, The nerd saves the day! At once, the portal at the end of the corridor stabilized, becoming the exact size and shape of the drone. But it didn't move. My turn, Blue said, and ran as fast as he could down the corridor. He threw his weight into the machine. It didn't budge. Blue tried it again. It was stuck. Twenty seconds to rift manifestation, Chroma Computer said. Back up, Blue yelled. Red looked over to Green. Green nodded at him. Red turned and ran. Green braced himself as best as he could, wrapping his arms around an exposed pipe in the hopes that his body wouldn't go flying. 
Suddenly, Purple dashed into the room and grabbed the disc as well. No worries, Green panted. I got this. Purple didn't let go. Red charged into Corridor 12. Ten seconds, Chroma Computer announced. Red threw himself at the drone. So did Blue. It moved just an inch. Five seconds. Together, Blue said. Three. They charged two, simultaneously. One. The drone slipped through the gate, which immediately vanished. The corridor shook violently. It was going to tear itself apart. And then... Everything was suddenly normal. The ground was still. Everything was quiet. Success, Yellow said. Sorry, there isn't much more we can do, Blue said to the scientist. He shook his head but smiled a little. This is most generous, he said, holding up the small capsule Blue had handed him. It may be only a computer, but the early tests are promising. It can only work with the little that remains here, Blue agreed. But at least you'll know you're working at peak efficiency with what little you do have. Let's hope it makes all the difference. If you need a few more hands or just someone to talk to, Blue continued, just call. We can stay in the dimension for a short while, after all. I'll do that. He looked up into the sky, the ordinary blue sky. It's a shame he's gone. Blue knew who he was talking about. What went wrong? He asked. I don't know, the scientist said. But he was built in a time of great need. I was captured by that tyrant. Desperate measures were needed. I must have been lax in programming his ethical matrix. I never realized. If I had only a little fix. Blue put a hand on his shoulder. I know it may be cold comfort right now. But if he hadn't gone dimension hopping so aggressively, we might not have noticed what you were doing in time. The rift would have formed, but because of him it didn't get far. Not just because of him, the scientist said. We owe you everything. Blue shook his head. Just part of the job. Red, blue, yellow, and green all sat around the conference table, one of Chroma Computer's cylindrical white capsules hanging from the middle of the ceiling. An excessive number of time tokens have been depleted in this operation, Chroma Computer said. However, given the scale of this threat and its direct implication on Simulator, virtually unlimited resources would have been justified. So we're not getting a lecture? Red asked, mildly surprised. Only a forewarning, Chroma replied. It will take some time to replenish the time tokens. Operations will be severely restricted in the meantime. And while we wait, there are still things to go over. Like what? Red asked. We found the source of everything. Of Tyrant Tyrannus's power, of Redux, of the stripped mines of Iteration 8937. 8397, Yellow corrected. Whatever, Red said dismissively. 8937 is the one with the shark people, Green reminded him. Whatever, Red repeated more firmly. Incidentally, I can teach you to speak shark person if you're ever interested. Iterations 296 and 304 also have that language. Though strangely, it's their Italian. Not the point, Red hissed. The point is, what else do we need to be debriefed on? Just one thing, Blue said knowledgeably. This all started because Simulator attacked the scientist after he freed himself. A full analysis of that mission reveals that this was an unfortunate error, Chroma Computer elaborated. The scientist was mistakenly believed to be working willingly with the tyrant, and with little time before a rift formed, we settled for returning him to his proper dimension. No inquiries were made. Are you saying that if it wasn't for that, if someone just asked a few questions, none of this would have happened? Red asked. That is correct, Chroma Computer stated. Well, Red continued, who was it? Who was the agent sent in? That would be Agent Green, the computer answered. Ah! Red said triumphantly. This is all your fault! Yellow frowned at Red from across the table. Ah, uh, that is my bad, Green said mildly. I seem to recall the briefing only mentioned a tyrant creating an interdimensional weapon, but I should have been more thorough. Perhaps if we had scanners that detected people or objects of extra-dimensional origin standard, this could have been avoided. An excellent suggestion, Agent Green. We shall begin running surveys into the efficacy of this proposal, Chroma announced. Wait, wait, is that all? Red protested. This was all his fault. Now, now, Red, Green said. We're all on the same side here. Even so, Blue said, shouldn't at least the score change? Ah, yes, Chroma Computer agreed. Score has been adjusted. Green is now in third place with a score of 588,942. Wait, what about me? Red asked eagerly. 
you have 602,578. Yes, Red said. New high score. I'm number one. That's not entirely correct, Chroma Computer said. You are in second place. Wait, then who's in first? They can't possibly have a higher score than that. Green was the only one with a score over 600,000. That is also incorrect, Chroma Computer replied. Then who is it? Red demanded. He looked around the room, and then his eyes settled on Blue. Blue's face was entirely neutral, but Red still glared at him. You, he growled. Now, why would you think that? Blue said casually. Is that why you're always telling me what to do? You think you're better because you have a higher score? I don't know what you're talking about. What's your score? Blue shrugged. I don't keep track. Chroma, what's his score? Red asked. I'm sorry, I cannot disclose that information to you at this time. Blue, it is you, isn't it? You're being paranoid. Go ask Yellow if it's him. Don't be silly, of course it's not Yellow. Hey, it could have been me. Computer, is it Yellow? Yellow is currently in sixth place. Oh, you don't hide my information. Thanks a lot, Chroma. Blue, you're the only secret one. Get back here. Just tell me what your score is. I'm going to the cafeteria. I'm hungry. Blue! Next time! Ethan Swanson may be the most brilliant teenager on the planet, but that doesn't mean hard times aren't heading his way. One night, a strange visitor appears and his family vanishes. In a search for revenge, he hacks his way into discovering a powerful powered armored suit to make this possible. Tempest launches next time on the Mirage Barrage. <laughs>